chapter 16. The reading begins with verse 20. Leviticus 16, verse 20. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Good to see you this morning. You all made it. Changed your clocks and made it on time. Probably won't wake up for another hour. At least we're here, right? Leviticus 16, beginning with verse 20. When he hath made an end of reconciling the holy, and the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, he shall bring the live goat. And Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions and all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat and shall send him away by the hand of the fifth and into the wilderness. And the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities unto a land not inhabited. He shall let go the goat in the wilderness. Aaron shall come into the tabernacle of the congregation and shall put off the linen garments which he put on when he went into the holy and shall leave them there. He shall wash his flesh with water in the holy place and put on his garments and come forth and offer his burnt offering and the burnt offering of the people and make an atonement for himself and for the people. And the fat of the sin offering shall he burn upon the altar he that let go the goat for the scapegoat shall wash his clothes and bathe his flesh in water and afterward come into the camp. And the bullock for the sin offering and the goat for the sin offering whose blood was brought in to make atonement in the holy place shall one carry forth without the camp. They shall burn in the fire their skins and their flesh and their dung. And he that burneth them shall wash his clothes and bathe his flesh in water, and afterward he shall come into the camp. The title of the message this morning is The Red-Tongued Goat. The Red-Tongued Goat. Let's pray. Father, we come before you right now. We ask your blessing, God, to rest upon the reading of your holy word. We thank you, Lord, for your anointing this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. You get the title? It's the Red Tongue Goat. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. We could title this many things. We could title it The Scapegoat. We could title it Led by the Fit Man. But I'm going to title it The Red Tongued Goat for impression in your mind about what happened to the scapegoat. Amen. This deals with the Day of Atonement. Say with me, the Day of Atonement. It is still to this day the most holy day on the calendar for the nation of Israel. It was the most important day uh, back in the days of Moses all the way through hi their history. A very, very significant day for them. Amen. Because it was the day when their sins were covered. So it was extremely important to them. It is still today, as I said, the most holy day on their calendar. It is called Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur. Yom Day Kippur. Translated differently. Different people translate it to mean atonement, to mean cleansing, say praise the Lord, or to cover. But you get the picture. Yom Kippur, to cover, to cleanse. Amen. To make atonement for the people. And all through the year, the people had brought sacrifices to the Lord and laid their hands on those sacrifices. And then those sacrifices were slain and offered to God, sin offerings and burnt offerings. And all those offerings and sin offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings did was roll forward the sins of the people. Amen. I owe yous, if you understand what I mean. Those sins were not taken away. They were just I owe yous. And so the sin, once the offerings were made, was rolled forward and rolled forward and rolled forward. 
but never taken away because the blood of those animals could not pay the price for man's sin. So God just made a way that those sins could be covered over and then rolled forward. So they were IOUs. And all those IOUs through the year would be gathered up, if you understand what I'm saying, that credit card, and then they would be placed on this one head of this goat and the slain of another goat. All those IOUs were then placed on this one IOU, if you understand what I mean. There was a bringing together of all these debts, all these IOUs, all these sacrifices, and then placed on that one sacrifice called the Day of Atonement, when all the sins of the people, confessed and unconfessed, would be placed upon the head of that goat. And then you'd have one IOU. And then year by year, the same process took place over and over. All the IOUs of all the sacrifices through the year are placed on this one IOU called the scapegoat. And through the years, through the years, these IOUs would pile up until Jesus Christ would come and then take away the sin of the world, not just cover them or make atonement in the sense of covering them, but He would completely remove them out of our lives. Pay the price, amen, of which this was a type. The Bible tells us the Day of Atonement, the 16th chapter, the first thing that the high priest has responsibility for is to make sure that the tabernacle is properly set up and it's dedicated and everything is right in the tabernacle. And also his clothing, if you look at verse 3 of chapter 16, Thus shall Aaron come into the holy with a young bullock for a sin offering and ram for a burn offering. And then it says, He shall put on the holy linen coat he shall have the linen breeches upon his flesh, shall be guarded with linen girdle, with a linen mitre, shall he be attired. These are holy garments. Therefore shall he wash his flesh in water and so put them on. Once he makes the sacrifices necessary for the tabernacle and for himself, he takes those beautiful garments off and he only puts on linen garments. The, the garments of beauty are not uh, on him when he goes in and makes the atonement for the people. Okay, you with me so far? Now the Bible tells us, along with other sacrifices, there's two goats. One goat, the Scripture says, is for the Lord. Okay, let's look at it. The Bible tells us in verse 7, He shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord, and the other lot for the what? The scapegoat. Okay, so what's going to happen here is that this one goat that's going to die, one is going to die. Blood is going to be shed from one goat. And the Bible says the goat that dies is given to the Lord. Okay? There's another goat that's not going to die it's called the scapegoat. That lot is for the people. For forgiveness for the people. Is everybody understanding this up, up to this point? Now the term here in verse 8, scapegoat, then you see it in verse 10, you see scapegoat. and Throughout the passage you'll see this term scapegoat comes from a Hebrew word, la azazel. La azazel. Now, I've got to give this to you. It may not seem significant for you, but I've got to give it to you so you'll understand. La Azazel, which we have in our translation in the English, scapegoat, is translated differently by different people. Okay? La Azazel or Azel, Azazel, by some people, they believe that it was a demon spirit in the wilderness. That you know the goat, one goat is going to be slain and this scapegoat is going to be taken out in the wilderness. And so Azazel, they say, means a demon in the wilderness and that this scapegoat is being presented to the devil or being presented to the demon of the wilderness. I do not believe that. Okay? The second uh, way of, in Hebrew mind is Azazel. Uh, also is translated rock of precipice. 
and the Jews taught, and I've done an extensive study on this, the Jews taught that this scapegoat was taken out to a cliff and cast off the cliff. And therefore, that, that, uh, at that place of destruction, or the rock of destruction, uh, this goat also died. That is not in the Bible. This is something that they may have practiced in their history. But the Bible never told the Jews to take the scapegoat and cast it off the cliff. That is something they practiced. And I think maybe it's because of the way they translated the word. Okay, again, the first one, they believed it was being offered to the, the spirit of the wilderness, a demonic spirit of the wilderness, when it was cast off the rock of the precipice. That's the way they translated the word. And so probably that's why they cast the goat off. But the Bible does not say that. The Bible tells us very clearly in verse 21 that the scapegoat was to be taken into the wilderness. Amen. And there, when it went into the wilderness, it was let go in verse 22. That's what the Bible says. So you know how it is when it comes to the things of God. A lot of times people take and they add to it. And maybe by the translation of the word thought, well, we got to take this goat out. we got to offer it to the devil. No, these goats were for God. I mean, you're not paying the devil for sin. I mean, you with me here? And, and the Bible doesn't say to take it and throw it off the rock of a preposition and, and it die. It says you take it out in the wilderness and you let it, you let it go. So I believe the third translation of the word Azazel is a better translation and that means simply this, the goat of departure. And that's where we get this phrase in the King James, the scapegoat. Now that term scapegoat is still used today when somebody else is being blamed for the guilt of somebody else. And so we see the scapegoat is taking the place for the guilt of somebody else, the sins of the people. All right? Praise the Lord. Now what I just shared with you in about five minutes took years and years and years of study. So you you got blessed. You don't have to go down and say, you know, well, is Azazel a demon spirit in the wilderness? Was the goat cast off the rock of a preposition in the wilderness. You see, you don't even have to study that now. Hallelujah. So just stick with the Bible. There's a reason why they translated it scapegoat. And the Bible is very clear that he was simply led out into the wilderness by a fit man. Now, this is a wonderful, wonderful type. It is a beautiful, beautiful picture. Two goats. Just like we studied last week, two birds concerning leper, the leper. One bird was killed, the other was uh, dipped in the blood of that dead bird, and it was allowed to fly into the open heavens. A dual type. The first bird is a type of Jesus Christ dying on Calvary. The second bird that flies into the open heavens with the marks of death upon it is a picture of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So when we come to this passage, we have one goat that is slain. That's Calvary. That's the Lord's lot. That's Jesus going and dying on the cross. The second goat is left alive and it's taken by a fit man into the wilderness. It's bearing the sins of the people. It's taking the sins of the people into the land of unforgetfulness. Or really not unforgetfulness, the land of forgetfulness. That goat's taken into the land of separation. It's taken in the land uninhabited. As the Bible says, it's taken into the no man's land. And it's let loose in this place, never to be seen again. And so what we have in this picture and in this type is we see the first goat being slain is Jesus dying on the cross for my sin. The second goat that is a live goat taken into the wilderness with the sins of the people on its head is the sins of the people being taken away, being removed from their camp as that goat walks out in the hands of a fit man. Now, this fit man was very, very strong physically. He was not a weak man. He was very, very strong. And he would lead this goat out in the wilderness. 
But the first goat, as I said, was sacrificed. And then Aaron the high priest went into the Holy of Holies and sprinkled the blood of that scapegoat on the mercy seat. Do you understand that? Then the fit man took that goat uh, into the wilderness, led by the fit man, this very strong man. And as he led this goat out of the camp, the people were watching their sins removed. They were, if you can understand it, the first goat is dying for our sins. The second goat is a picture of us experiencing the salvation of which that first goat represents. That fit man walked out with that goat. Amen. Say praise the Lord. Hallelujah to the Lamb. And there was, if you study, you can go and study. There's a commentary. Uh, let's see. I believe it's by Matthew Henry. You can go study it. I did it years and years ago. But Matthew Henry says that there was a red fillet or a red ribbon uh, on the head of that goat. And uh, it, they would lead that goat out with the sins of the people, that scarlet ribbon on its head. Amen. Are you all with me here? But the rabbi said, 40 years before the destruction of Jerusalem, which is around 30 A.D., that when they practiced taking that scapegoat out into the wilderness, that that ribbon turned solid white. Because Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of this type. They said it themselves and they pinpointed to the time of Jesus' death when that ribbon around that head turned white. Are y'all with me right now? That fit man very strong led that goat out into the wilderness, as I said. He started in the daytime. He walked out with that goat and he would go from one station to another station, booths that were set up along the highway. And as he brought that scapegoat bearing the sins of the people to each one of those booths, there would be a man there that would lift up the handkerchief as a sign back to the camp that the sins of the people have come this far. And the people would rejoice. And so we'd go to the next booth. And when that goat got to that booth, the man would signal to the camp, the sins have made it thus far. And on and on and on it went. That fit man took that goat during the daytime. It took him in the desert. That goat was not allowed to have water. It became thirsty. And as it was walking in the wilderness, its red tongue would begin to hang out with thirst. The heat would begin to affect that goat. That fit man led that goat all day long in that hot, dry wilderness. That goat became thirsty. Its red tongue hanging out as it's making its way out of the camp into no man's land, the land uninhabited. At night time, if they had not reached their destination at night time, that goat had no place to lay its head. Until finally, as the Bible tells us, that fit man, that very strong man, went to the wilderness in that place and released that goat. That goat was never seen ever, ever again. It was released into the land of forgetfulness. The land of separation, no man's land, the land uninhabited. So that the sins would never, never, ever, ever be seen again by the people of Israel. Give the Lord praise in this house. And then having released that goat, then that fit man would return back uh, to the camp. And he would wash his clothes as the Bible said. The scripture tells us after the whole process was finished, the killing of, this, of that one goat for the Lord and the blood sprinkled there on the day of atonement by Aaron the high priest on the mercy seat. And then the scapegoat having been taken out in the wilderness and let go and the fit man returned, then the high priest would walk out and he would put his beautiful garments back upon his body. And when that happened, the people would, be, would gather around him and they would begin to congratulate the high priest because the job had been finished. And God, when He went into that Holy of Holies, only once a year. In fact, the passage says in Leviticus 16 to Aaron, it says, you don't go in there anytime you want to. You only go once a year after proper sacrifices have been made. 
he, gone, he had gone in there and God had not killed him. And he walked out. And when he did, everybody started celebrating. Everybody started congratulating the high priest because of what had happened there on that day. It was an exciting day that took place. And, and the high priest made his way home celebrating and rejoicing. And there was a huge sound of a trumpet which declared that the sins of the people had been not only died for typically, but that that scapegoat had taken their sins completely away. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. So you can imagine the celebration that had taken place. Before that ceremony was complete, it was a time of sorrow. It was a time of repentance. It was a time of fasting. They were commanded, all the people in the nation were commanded to fast one day. And they fasted and they, they repented and they were sorry for their sin. And so now the thing, the ceremony, the ritual is complete. And so now everybody is celebrating and rejoicing. Their sins have been removed as far as the east is from the west. Amen. Never to be seen again. As far as the east is from the west, if you start heading east today, it'll never, it'll never become west. If you start heading west, it'll never become east. And what he's saying, as far as the east is from the west, he says, you can't find it. For every, ever, ever separated. And so now their sins are separated from them. They are forgiven typically in the land of separation, never to see those sins Again, And so basically that's what took place on the Day of Atonement. All of this was fulfilled by the Lord Jesus Christ. The central passage of this is found in verse 34. This shall be an everlasting statute unto you to make an atonement for the children of Israel for all their sins once a year. And He did as the Lord commanded Moses. I want to focus this morning on the type and the anti-type of what this is all about. When you talk about a type in the Bible, if you don't know what the word type means, a type means the seal. It's the instrument. Maybe you have seen somebody take uh, to a document, a piece of paper, a seal or an instrument, and they place it on that paper and they clamp down on it. And they leave an impression on that paper. The seal is what, when you talk about the type, a type means the seal. Okay? The antitype is the impression on the paper that the seal leaves. And they are exact. They are identical. And so when you talk about a type in the Old Testament, you're talking about the picture. You're talking about the instrument. When you talk about the anti-type, that's the fulfillment of the type. And they're exactly the same. So when I study this type of the scapegoat, the red-tongued goat, led by the fit man, it's going to be fulfilled by the Lord Jesus Christ exactly in all of its details. So we know, first of all, the first goat that was the lot fell for the Lord, uh, that goat was set apart to die. We know that was fulfilled by Jesus Christ when He died on the cross for our sins. The second goat, the scapegoat, is also a type of Jesus Christ in removing our sins completely from us, totally, into the land of forgetfulness. When we study the life of Jesus Christ, we have to understand that He fulfilled every aspect. The fit man, the strong man, is the Holy Ghost. The fit man, the strong man, is the Spirit of God that was in Jesus. The fit man, the Spirit of God that was in Jesus, we see that fit man leading Jesus throughout His life. The Bible tells us that He was born by the fit man, by the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost overshadowed Mary and she was with child, the virgin-born Son of God, Jesus Christ. 
as a result of the Holy Ghost or the fit man overshadowing her. We see Jesus' life when he becomes 12 years of age. He is found in the temple. Say praise the Lord. What the Bible records for us concerning his childhood is very little. The Bible simply tells us, amen, about his birth. The scripture tells us when he's 12 years of age, there he is in the temple. The Bible doesn't tell us he's breathing on birds and causing them to fly into the air. That's not in the Bible. The first miracle that Jesus did was turning the water to the wine, to wine. The Bible said that was the first miracle. He didn't breathe on a bird and send it flying into the air. I think they made a, mer- a, a movie recently I called The Young Messiah. Or The Little Messiah. I haven't seen the movie, but I did see a little bit of a trailer. He's breathing on or something happens, the bird flies. No. First miracle he did was when he turned the water to the wine. So, if y'all go see that movie, you remember that? Wasn't that wonderful how Jesus took that dead bird and, as a little boy and made it come alive? Okay, so anyway, don't have Bible for it. But the Bible says at 12 years of age, Jesus was in the temple. He was led by the fit man to his father's house. And when his mother and his father couldn't find him, they had lost him on the road as they made their way back home. They couldn't find him. They made their way back to Jerusalem and they found Jesus, the young Messiah, if you want that. They found Him in the temple. And He looks up to them and He says, Did you not know I must be about my Father's business? What He's saying is, I was led by the fit man here. And I'm doing what the fit man, what the Spirit of God is is told me to do. I must be about the fit man's business. I must be about the Spirit of God or the Father's business. Say praise the Lord. And then the Bible says that he went home with his mother and his father and he became subject unto them. And he grew in wisdom and knowledge. Amen. So on and so forth. Physically he grew and spiritually he grew and became subject to his mother and his father at 12. And then the Bible tells us all about his life. He's, he's, the Bible tells me that when it came time, Jesus Christ was led by the fit man to be baptized in the River Jordan. He's approximately 30 years of age. Some people say younger than that, but I'll give you approximate time frame of 30 years of age. Amen. Amen. We really don't know what happened between 12 and 30. Some people said he went to the Indies. Oh, you know, people come up with all kinds of things. But after 12, it must be about his father's business. It comes time now for him to fulfill his role. The Spirit of God leads him, directs him, to the river Jordan to be baptized by John there. Amen. He looks at his mama Mary and he says goodbye to her. And he's led by the Spirit to that river Jordan. And the Scripture tells us he's water baptized of John in the river Jordan. And a Spirit like a dove descends upon him. And the voice from heaven says, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Amen. And what does the Bible tell us after Jesus is water baptized there? He's led of the Spirit into the wilderness. Like the fit man leading this scapegoat into the wilderness, Jesus is led by the fit man into the wilderness. And there He fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. Now, I don't know for sure because the Bible is not clear about this. The Bible doesn't tell me that Jesus even drank water. So just like that goat led into the wilderness, that red-tongued goat, thirsty from the heat. Is it possible that Jesus also not only fasted in that wilderness being led by the Spirit, but that He also thirsted in fulfillment of this type? But there he is in the wilderness. 
And after 40 days and 40 nights of praying and fasting, the devil appears to him and begins to tempt Jesus. And each time the devil tempts Jesus those three times, he said, it is written. You see what he's doing? He's using the type. The type was available to him. The word of God was available to him. So he said, I'm going to use the word. It is written. And three times he defeated the temptation of the devil using the seal, if you will, or using the type, the word of God, to, to defeat the devil. Give the Lord praise in the house. After... He comes out of the wilderness that time having defeated the devil. The scripture tells us very clearly in the gospel of Luke, the fourth chapter, that he came out in the power of the Spirit. He's not only now led by the Spirit, but now he's in the power of the Spirit. After 40 days and 40 nights of fasting, having defeat the powers of darkness. Give the Lord praise. Amen. And so the scripture tells us he comes out of the wilderness. And he begins to work miracles. And the first miracle he works is the turning of water to wine at the marriage of Cana. And so on and so forth. We see him throughout his life. Led by the fit man. Only doing what he saw the father do. The fit man. Only doing what he heard the father say. He would only speak that. His whole life was controlled by the Spirit of the living God as the fit man led him day by day. Everything he would fulfill, scriptures and types and pictures and shadows, all the various feasts, he would declare to the Jews that he is the light of the world. He is the door of the sheepfold. And on and on and on and when he would tell them, I am that I am as he was led by the fit man throughout his whole life, controlled by the Spirit of the living God, until finally it comes time for him to go into the Garden of Gethsemane. He's led there by the Spirit to this place. When he gets there, he begins to pray. And he prays so intensely that the Bible says drops of blood begin to fall from his brow. He got up and he went and he found the disciples asleep. And he asked them, could you not watch with me for one hour? Watch with me one hour. Do you not understand how important it is to pray? He's talking to his disciples the eve of his captivity, the eve of him being taken by the leaders, and these disciples are sleeping, not knowing how important it is to pray. And so when they come and get Jesus, it's Jesus doesn't fall apart because he's led by the Spirit. He spent time in prayer. It's his disciples who have not prayed that go to pieces. But the Bible tells us he sees his disciples asleep. He admonishes them to pray. And the Scripture says he goes back and he prays some more. He picks up the fight again. He takes up the battle again. And he goes to pray. And he prays until the blood drops from his brow. And he says this, not my will be done, but thy will be done. He said, I'm being led by the fit man. Not my will, but the Spirit of God. Not my will, but the fit man be done. He leaves the Garden of Gethsemane. And through the night, he's led by the fit man. Until he finally comes to Calvary. And the Bible says they crucified Him there. While He's hanging on that cross, dying as the first goat died, fulfilling also the bullock offerings, the sin offerings that would have been offered. While He's hanging on that cross, He says, My God, My God, why hast Thou 
forsaken me. Typically the fit man and only type. God didn't leave him. But he felt forsaken of God on that cross. The fit man typically had left him. Because he became the sin bearer. Then we hear his voice. By the way, that's a fulfillment of Psalm 22. We hear his voice lifted up. And he says, hanging on that cross, as he's experiencing the wrath of God and hell that you would experience, as he's hanging on that cross, as that red-tongued goat is fulfilled and tight, he says, I thirst. I am in the desert. I'm experiencing the wrath of God, the fiery wrath of God upon me for the sins of me and you and for all people, just like those goats, amen, for the sins of all the people. He said, I thirst in fulfillment to the red-tongued goat. Amen, hallelujah. Amen. He hangs on that cross until finally he cries, it is finished. He was led by the fit man all of his life. They take his body down off of that cross and they put him in the sepulcher and there he lies for three days and for three nights. And then the fit man, the Spirit of God, raises him. The fit man returns. And when he returns, he raises Jesus. The Bible says in the book of Romans that Jesus was raised by the power of the Holy Spirit. He was raised by the fit man. He came walking out of the grave the third day. But that's not the end of the story. Because not only did the fit man return and raise Jesus Christ from the dead, but the Bible tells us on the day of Pentecost, 50 days after Jesus Christ rose from the dead, the fit man came back into the camp, came into the church, and filled the church with the Holy Ghost. You got the fit man living inside of you, and I got the fit man living inside of me. And we're led by the fit man, the strong power of the living God. And so Jesus Christ fulfilled every aspect he not only died for my sin on that cross, but like the scapegoat, He carried my sins away into no man's land. No man can bring them back up. Into the land uninhabited. Into the place, the land of separation, in the place of forgetfulness. Removing my sin completely from me. So that I never, never, ever, ever have to be confronted by them ever again. And so Jesus Christ fulfilled this type of the, of the Day of Atonement with His death. And not just His death, but with His life. He lives today. And because He lives today, my sins have not just been covered. My sins have been taken away. And so now, just as the high priest would begin to rejoice, and there would be the trumpet sound, the, the sound of a jubilee trumpet. It would sound and declare that the work had been finished and Israel breaks out into a shout and a celebration because the sins are removed from them. Jesus Christ, when the fit man came back into the camp, all of a sudden, we heard a joyful sound. People began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. The psalm says, blessed is he who hears the joyful sound. That was talking about the day of atonement. When the high priest went in and came out alive and the sins of the people had been removed and God had accepted the sacrifice, there was a joyful sound. The sounding of the trumpet and the sounding of the pomegranate bells. 
at the hem of the garment of the priest, he's alive. And so on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Ghost was poured out and people began to speak in tongues, that's when the bells began to ring. That was God saying that the sacrifice of Jesus Christ has been accepted and that your sin and my sin has been removed far from me. He died for me and He bore my sin away. And so now when you're water baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, your sins are not just covered, your sins are taken away. Never to be remembered ever again. That goat, when it died, it was dedicated to the Lord. The first goat was dedicated to the Lord. The second goat was for the people, for the forgiveness of the sins of the people. And it is in that beautiful picture that you and I, when we meditate upon it, we see Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. And we see the forgiveness of our sins with this goat going away. Jesus risen from the dead. Today, my sin is not just covered. My sin is taken away. Never to be remembered again to that place of forgiveness. You want to know what happened to you when you got baptized in water in the name of Jesus? Your sins were all washed away. And I have, I have to let you know that when Jesus died on the cross in fulfillment of the first goat and then rose again, amen, from the dead, also on the cross, the fulfillment of the second goat, scapegoat, it wasn't to pay the devil anything. That's right. Amen. The scapegoat was a picture of Jesus Christ. That's right. And to say that that goat was dedicated to the devil is wrong. That's right. It was God that we had sinned against. It was God who had, amen, redemption had to come. The price had to be paid, not to the devil but to God for your and my sin. And so now He looks at you, <clears throat> guilty though you and I may be guilty of sin, He looks at you and says the price has been paid. There's not even any IOUs. The price has been paid in full. Amen. And your sins have been taken completely away. Walk out free. You don't have to die. You don't have to go to hell. You don't have to be in that place where the rich man was. The Bible says, lifted up his eyes, being in torment in those flames. And what did he cry? He said, Father Abraham, send Lazarus that he may dip his finger in water and come and cool my tongue because I'm tormented in these flames. Because Jesus fulfilled that red-tongued goat typology. You don't ever have to feel the flames of fire in hell ever again because He took that. He said, I thirst. If you were to die and go to hell, you would experience what the goat experienced being led by the fit man into the desert in a hot and dry place. You would experience what Jesus felt on the cross when He said, I thirst. You would experience what the rich man experienced when he was in that place of unquenchable fire. I thirst. But because Jesus took my place and He took your place, are you thankful today that if it wasn't for Him, you would be thirsty in the lake of fire someday? But he was the red tongue goat. How could he be a goat? How could he be seen as a goat? I can understand him being seen as a pigeon, an innocent pigeon. I can understand our dove. I could see him pictured as an innocent lamb, submissive to the will of the Father. But how could he be pictured as a goat? Because the Bible says he became sin. For us. And that goat is a picture of sin. He became the goat when He hung upon that cross. Not literally, but in fulfillment of the type. He became sin for us. And the curse 
fell upon Jesus Christ. And because of that, when you get to heaven someday, you'll be there because He did all of that for you. He did it all for me. He spared me and He spared you from the eternal flames of fire where you would never ever, your thirst would never be quenched. I've already told you that 40 years, they said 40 years before the destruction of the temple, and the temple was destroyed in 70 A.D. The rabbi said 40 years before the destruction of the temple puts you around 30 A.D. Amen. Amen. They noticed something had changed. They took the scapegoat out, and when they got it to its destination, they noticed that the red fillet, the red ribbon on its head, changed to white. Though your sins be red as scarlet, red like crimson, they shall become white as wool. And the rabbis, can you imagine? Let me just tell you this. If if they didn't understand what was happening, maybe it clicked in them. Maybe this is... The possibility, the reason why many of them turn to the Lord. Because they had to put two and two together. This Jesus, the Messiah, died at the same time that that ribbon no longer stayed red. It turned solid white. That's a miracle from God. He's a fulfillment of the day of atonement. And I'm thankful today for all that He has done for me. Let's stand. Father God, we come before Your throne today and we thank You, God, for Your provision. We thank You for the blood that You shed for us. Lord Jesus, when we stand in Your presence, we can't repay You for what You have done. All we can do is love You and live for You the way that you should be lived for. Serve you the way that you should be served. And now, God, as you filled us with the Spirit, the Bible says, Know ye not that as many as are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. Lord, not just those that were once filled with the Holy Ghost years and years ago who are no longer led, but it's those that are led by the Spirit. They are the sons of God. Father God, we thank You right now as we yield our life to You. We thank You that You died for us on the cross, paid the price for our sin. We thank You, Lord, today for removing them far from us. We celebrate today that provision that's fulfilled. We thank You, God, for being more than atonement. We thank You, God, for removing our sins completely from our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you lift your